This is presentation number two uh, for my Her History 1302 class, Depression in the Dust Bowl. This resumes right where part one uh, left off. For those of you guys who watched part one, you'll see that at, um, at uh, time marker 126, one hour, 26 minutes, there was a, uh, uh, a technical problem. Sorry about that. This picks up right where that left off. So in part one, if you need to go back and take a look at it, it's the immediate aftermath of the crash. It talks about the Hoover administration, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and he, uh, his election. And it talks about this 100 days worth of honeymoon that um, Roosevelt has with Congress. Now I left off of that with the alphabet soup programs, of which the NRA was one, and I discussed that. And that was, uh, the NRA was a, um, a sort of a pilot program to see if this concept would work. In this presentation, we'll pick up with the alphabet soup programs. We'll talk about an icon of it. Then we'll talk about the continued recovery and other um, examples of the alphabet soup programs. Then we'll talk about um, the global depression. I'll have a few things to say about that. But then uh, I'll talk about uh, politics and how uh, FDR did not have it all his own way. There was pushback from two elements, and that is um, the Supreme Court being one, and there was uh, problems that he was having with his own, within his own party, within the Democratic Party. Then I'll have something to say about international politics, and that'll be our continued uh, idea of isolationism. And that will be the end of the 1930s um, presentation. From there, it will go to uh, the rise of the dictators. And that'll be a presentation all by itself. Uh, make sure you take a look at it uh, on YouTube. That'll be your next uh, assignment. But with that in mind, let's go on to uh, the Alphabet Soup programs. Now, in a broad overview, what we're talking about here is Keynesian economics. It's named after John Menard Keynes. Uh, John Menard Keynes talked about how uh, when we have an economic downturn, that the best way, the most efficacious way to recover from that downturn is to plug money in at the bottom of the economy. Strong note here. Today, there's a lot of... Um, political debate about how to recover from an economic downturn. We've been through, we've gone through several of these in my own lifetime, and there's been a couple of them in your lifetime, at least. Well, one political side suggests that the way you do that is through some sort of trickle-down economics. Now, that's been widely disproven. The better way to go about uh, recovering from an economic downturn is Keynesian economics. And the idea here is to put people back to work, find some project for them to do, get something to put people back to work. You have to disrupt or destroy the paradox of thrift. That's what you have to get rid of. In part one, I talked about that, and FDR had effectively gotten rid of that. But then you can't just wait around for the economy to like pick up on its own. The better way to go about it is to come up with ideas. And that is the alphabet soup programs. That is the New Deal. So in a broad overview, we have a lot of these programs. I think your book lists 13 separate programs. The Civilian Conservation Corps is one of them. Strong note here now, your target market is as you see in these images. You take healthy young men, that is your target market. And these are young men who just got out of high school, who are still very young, uh, 17 to 21, 25 years old, something like that. They're in a very dangerous time in their life. They could uh, find themselves in trouble. They're, they don't have a job. They don't have anything to fall back on. And so that is your target market. And you tell these men, listen, we're going to pay you uh, $45 a month, but we're also going to pay for your room and board. You don't have to pay for anything else. We'll give you a place to stay and food to eat. And they called it back in those days, three hots and a cot. That is, say, three hot meals and a place to sleep, a cot. So in effect, this $45 a month, that was basically, you know, um, your pay. That's uh, money that was uh, available for you to spend. And $45 a month plus room and board, that's not bad pay at a time when there's millions and millions of people that are out of work. Well, the idea then is to send them out to the West or send them into some impoverished location, some underdeveloped location, and then do exactly what you see on, the, on these pictures. These pictures are the CCC at work. These are CCC individuals doing what they were going to do. For example, in that upper photograph, they're just building a road. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Let me make it very clear for you here. Those gentlemen are building a road the old-fashioned way, the hard way. Uh, Romans building Roman roads in Europe 2,000 years ago would have understood exactly what these guys are doing. You've got to dig out below the frost line. Then you've got to lay in some kind of foundation. Uh, then you've got to continue to make the culverts. And then you've got to do the surface layment. And so this is a lot of hard, back-breaking work. So what these guys are doing is not easy, but it's not complex either. And you're not letting a lot of machines do the work. You're letting the men do the work. And so they're building a road the old-fashioned way, and it's keeping those guys busy. They are earning their $45 a month. Uh, you might send them to one of the National Park Services and have them build um, uh, campgrounds. You know, dig out big pits, line them all with stones and concrete, and they've got a big giant fire pit. Or build uh, park benches. You know, clear out areas for campers to go out there and take a look at the wild, wild west. Under any circumstances, these men are earning their money. So there's all sorts of projects that they're going to be involved in. A takeoff on that is another um, CCC, I'm sorry, another um, alphabet soup program, which is the CWA, the Civil Works Administration. So here you're going to uh, various parks uh, in towns. You're going to rebuild courthouses. You're going to build all sorts of other infrastructure in towns and cities. Uh, you're going to build baseball parks and, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, small projects in towns and villages. Now, strong note here. When we say Keynesian economics and you're going to put people back to work, which was, that's what the New Deal was built for, to put back people back to work. And then you zoom into the CWA, the Civil Works Administration. Don't be misled. People are saying, well, that's the government doing it. Well, when it comes to actually doing the project, the government's going to come up with the money, certainly. But then they're going to contract locals to actually do the work. In other words, it's going to be, you know, Joe Schmo's bricklaying company. They're going to provide the bricks. It'll be, you know, John Q. Smith's earth moving company, and they're going to provide uh, backhoes and bulldozers. It'll be somebody else's, you know, concrete company that are going to lay the concrete. And so those are, the dollars are provided by the government, certainly, but the actual work is done locally. It's local bricklayers that are doing this, local architects that are coming up with these designs. It's local contractors that are actually doing the work. Well, this is the other part of um, Keynesian economics. Well, those people are going to get paid for the job that they do. And what do they do with the money they make? They spend it. Now, this is critical to your understanding of Keynesian economics. The people that are doing these jobs are going to get paid and they're going to spend the money that they make. But somebody is there to meet their demands. These people that are working, they need boots, they need gloves, they need um, uh, wheelbarrows and, and clothing. They're going to want to have some food on the side, quite possibly. They're going to want to buy a lunchbox. So somebody's going to be there to meet that demand. And then what do those people do with the money that they make in turn? They're going to spend it. And somebody's going to be there to meet their demands. And so this creates a ripple effect in the economy, a positive ripple effect. By spending all this money, it creates and regenerates demand. And that is how our economy works. So the Public Works Administration, that's another one. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration, that's still with us. It's out there. The National Recovery Act, the National Industrial Recovery Act. I'm sorry, there's another one there. The Public Works Administration. The Public Works Administration is slightly different than the Civil Works Administration. Where the Civil Works Administration might do something in your local town or village, it might rebuild a courthouse in a small town someplace, the Public Works Administration looks for large pro projects that might be interesting for the people in a city. Uh, Fair Parks is a location uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth region. For example, the Will Rogers Coliseum, that is another uh, big giant um, alphabet soup program. It's a public works administration program. And so imagine if you've ever been to the, the Coliseum over there in Fort Worth, uh, imagine all of the bricks that go into it. Just take a picture of it. You know, take a look at a picture of it. There's millions of bricks in that thing. And then the floors are all made of this uh, kind of a um, uh, high aggregate concrete that's then all ground down and polished up. 
and there's little brass spreaders between every big slab of concrete. And there's a big giant frieze going across the uh, upper edge of it. Okay, a big giant series of paintings. That's a frieze. And it has this tower on it. In other words, it's very, very art deco when you look at it. Very art deco. I'm not interested even a little bit in Will Rogers Coliseum. I'm interested in how many people got put back to work. Think of all the guys out there running bulldozers that leveled all the ground. All the architects and engineers. All the surveyors that went to work out there. All the guys providing mortar and concrete to lay it all in. Finally, you know, it's all done. And somebody's out there painting stripes out there for people to park in, in the parking lot. And what did all those people in the Fort Worth area do with the money that they made? Well, they spent it in Fort Worth. It generated more jobs in Fort Worth in that particular example. And so these are gigantic projects, uh, large airports, you know, large city civic works projects in these big metropolitan areas that put a huge number of people back to work. And many of these projects are still out there. They're with us today. So the Public Works Administration spent $4 billion on various projects nationwide. Well, $4 billion, $1934, is a vast treasure of money. And this forms a catalyst to put people back to work. And that, in turn, helps to regenerate the economy. Let's move on to our next slide. And so I just want you guys to like continue on with this idea of how Keynesian economics, how the New Deal actually works. What's the practical application here? So our icon of the Alphabet Soup programs and the New Deal, our icon is the TVA. It is an Alphabet Soup program. It's the Tennessee Valley Authority. Later on, it could be that you're uh, presented with a task, and one of the test questions might be uh, something along the lines of, how does the New Deal work? Choose an icon program and show me how it works. Okay, well, the Tennessee Valley Authority was its a perfect example of the New Deal and one of the Alphabet Soup programs. So let's put this into economic language. Our demand is twofold. Here's our demand, flood control and electrification. That is our demand. Our supply is going to be 25 major dams and about 100 minor ones. I'll say it again. The supply side, I'm sorry, the demand side is electrification and flood control. The supply side is 25 major dams and about 100 minor ones. So let's talk about flood control first. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, the prevailing winds uh, in our weather system here in America, it goes from west to east. And as the wind is traveling across the Great Plains, downslope from the Rocky Mountains, it goes across the Great Plains, it picks up speed and it picks up a lot of moisture. Then it piles up against the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Blue Mountains and the Smoky Mountains. Right there where it says, between where it says West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. That's the Smokies and the Blue Ridge Mountains. Well, these mountains are not very high, but all that wind and all that moisture stacks up against those mountains. And then it just wrings out all that moisture. All that moisture's got to go someplace. So as you can see from the river system, it's going downstream into the Tennessee and the Cumberland Rivers. That goes into the Ohio River at Paducah. And then that goes into the Mississippi River at St. Louis. So this is a vast amount of water. And every year, spring, uh, early spring, late spring, and then again in the fall, we get these huge weather events. They would stack up against the Smoky Mountains and the Blue Ridge, and they would, like, wring all that water out, and you'd have a flood stage every year. Twice a year, there would be these big, giant floods. Well, by putting in all these dams, you're simply slowing all that down. You're controlling the water supply and let, instead of letting it just rush out all at once. So having put all these dams in with all these gigantic lakes in behind the dam, make the dams hydroelectric. In other words, put electronic generators on them. And while the upfront cost for that electrical generation is extremely high, dams are not cheap, they're expensive, the long term is really, really economical. In other words, that's how Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, uh, Louisiana, that's how they get their electricity to this very day. Parts of Arkansas, they're going to get their electricity this way. 
And so this is, uh, this is how they get you know, really inexpensive electricity to this very day. So while it looks like it's going to be a tremendous cost up front, in the long term, over the long haul, very, very economical. I'm not even interested in any of that. What I'm interested in is putting people back to work. So let's go to the next slide and build some dams. The Tennessee Valley Authority, one of our alphabet soup programs, a critical element of the New Deal. And all I want you guys to do is take a look at the images that you see here and understand what building one of these hi giant hydroelectric dams uh, really, really does mean in practical terms. Uh, take a look at the picture uh, in the upper left. I almost always start in the upper left, and we'll go kind of clockwise. It's difficult to get a scale on this picture, but there are two men standing on that big, gigantic device. And so that gives you an idea how huge these pieces of equipment are. If you look on down that big, gigantic room, you'll see there's another huge generator in behind it, and then a third one behind that one. If the camera had turned 90 degrees to the left, you'd see another one in the foreground. I don't care about these generators. I want you guys to think of how many uh, designers and engineers it took to like come up with that, those devices, which are still in place. 70 odd years later, they're still working. And so how much copper goes into those? How much steel? How much aluminum? You know, how many blueprints went into those? So here you have gigantic construction teams coming up with the design for this. Well, continue to think that through. These people want to get paid, and for that they have to have administrators. And the administrators are going to have staff secretaries. And these are thousands and thousands and thousands of individuals who are working on this project, either directly or indirectly, and all of this is like starting to generate money. It's putting money into their pick pockets, and they haven't even turned over, and they haven't done a bit of work. You have to do all the design work first. You have to do all the, you know, you have to get all the paperwork done and all the contracts done. And so millions of dollars were spent just getting it set up so we could start the project. Then all the blueprints are made up and all the ideas are made up and all the planning is made up, and then that's put into practical application. Then orders go out for all the equipment necessary to, like, build what you see here. Well, obviously, all this has to come mostly in component parts and then be put in on location. So think, think, think. When we talk about the Tennessee Valley Authority and they're building all these dams, you don't have to be located in Tennessee to do all of this work. In other words, the design project, the design element that you see just in that photograph that could have been done in Boston or Seattle or, you know, Detroit, Michigan or Chicago, Illinois. That could have been done anywhere. Then once the design was done and all the engineering was done, the basic ideas of it was done, then the plans could be sent out to manufacturing all over America. Then all over America, they produce all these parts, and then they put it on trucks and trains or whatever other transport that they're going to use, and they get it to the location. And finally, you know, it gets installed, and the next thing you know, wow, you have electricity. Not a little bit, but a lot of it. Apply that idea to the slide that you see next. I mean, the, the, the image that you see up there in the upper right. That's one of these dams that look, that's what they look like. So imagine how much concrete that went into this. Imagine how much design and engineering went into this. Uh, all the surveys, all the topographical engineering. Every dam is by its nature unique unto itself. In other words, no two locations are identical. The foundations of the dam are going to be wider or narrower. Uh, the, the depth of the dam is going to be wider or thicker. It's going to be higher or shorter depending entirely upon the location. So each dam has to be designed on its own as a standalone project. But if we have 25 major dams and over 100 minor ones, uh, we're, it's millions of tons of concrete, steel, turbines, thousands of miles of cable and lines, uh, big giant pieces of earth moving equipment, uh, Caterpillar Company, they make big giant earth moving equipment, and they're basically uh, in uh, Lima, Ohio. So imagine all these huge orders for earth moving equipment are going to go to Lima, Ohio, and Caterpillar is going to put thousands and thousands and thousands of people work, back to work building steam engines and bulldozers and uh, drag links and all kinds of other huge pieces of equipment. It's all going to get loaded up on trucks and trains and sent off to Tennessee to build all these projects. 
Well, how much steel goes into one of these big giant caterpillar uh, bulldozers? Those, those things weigh tons and tons and tons. So then in turn, how many people got put back down in the mines, digging out that taconite and all that coal to smelt all that metal, and then you know put it into a bulldozer so it could be sent to Tennessee to build one of these dams? How many people got put back to work? Again, the counter argument has been for almost 70 years now that the TVA, I'm sorry, the, the New Deal was just this big giveaway. No, people are working for that money. The evidence stands before you. And so this is a catalyst that gets the economy going again. Now, the proof is already out there. The proof is already in your notes. Go back, if you will, and take a look at that slide that had the Dow Jones Industrial Average on it. The slide that had that big giant graph, that big giant bunch of squiggly lines. And so again, I pointed this out when I showed you when I introduced that slide. Look at the part that says 1936. And you can see that the economy has returned to normal by 1936, 1937. It's our normal, ordinary economic output, according to the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And that is the flow of money. I can't give you a better example of the New Deal and these alphabet soup programs work working they're working it's it's perfectly obvious that they're working one other thing i'd like to point out and this is proof that the new deal worked it got people back to work and got the economy going again another counter argument against this is that it was world war ii that got us out of the great depression that is not true when the united states entered world war ii in very late 1941 with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and we will talk about that later. Well, immediately we're able to like produce ships and battleships and aircraft carriers and bombers, tanks and jeeps and trucks of every size. We're able to uniform millions of men and get them into action like really, really quickly. By 1942, we were beginning to push back hard. We'd had a turning point in the Pacific against the Japanese, and we're producing bombers by the thousands to go bomb the Germans. Now, if the Depression had still been going on in 1939, 1940, 1941, and 42, if the Depression had still been going on, we would not have been able to produce all those bombers, tanks, jeeps, trucks, aircraft, aircraft carriers, battleships. We would not have been able to do that. Instead, we would have had to start from the start, regenerate the economy, and get people back to work. They, in turn, would have to rebuild the steel industry. They'd have to like reform engineering units and, and design teams. But instead, all of those were in place. The miners were already back down the mines. The steel producers were already producing steel. The copper people were already producing copper. Ford Motor Company was producing cars. All the mo big motor companies were producing vehicles. When the war came along, all we had to do was get them to stop producing consumer goods and start producing war material. And our factories stood up to that task and got that done like right away. So by 1942, we were able to project force into Africa. We were able to produce, project force into the Pacific. We turned the war around and we began to supply ourselves and all of our allies, including the Russians and the Chinese. Well, if the Depression were still going on, when the war began, we would not have been able to do that. And so because we were able to produce all that stuff and, and have this gigantic contribution very, very early on in the war effort, it means that the Depression had to be over with. So when you think of the economy during the war, that is a different economy than the economy of the 1930s. The wartime economy is other-directed. It's other-directed in that we would not have produced all the tanks and jeeps and trucks and bombers and battleships unless the Nazis under Hitler were coming to get us, or unless the Japanese were coming to get us. They dragged us into that war. And in order to defeat them, then we produced all that stuff. And by producing all that war material, that created a wartime economy. And that's different than what we're talking about here. Let's continue on with this alphabet soup program. Let me just give you a couple of more quick examples. It won't take long at all to get through these other slides. 
but I wanted to show that um, FDR is thinking out, out of the box. He's, he's trying to get the entire economy back to work. Here's a, a case study, a very quick case study. And it has to do with Dorothy Alange. There she is on top of that car there in the upper left. Now, Dorothy Alange worked for the Farm Security Administration. And she is doing propaganda. Very quick note here. The FSA had to give cash money to farmers. Farmers were, are, were then and are now the very root, the very basic element of our economy, of any economy, anybody's economy. In other words, workers have to have food to eat. The food has to come from one group, and that's called farmers. Well, if necessary, the farmers can feed themselves. They live on a farm. But in order to produce enough to feed a larger population, as it turns out, farmers, of all the people in our economy, have to have cash. They have to have cash somewhere. In order to produce enough to feed a broader economy, farmers have to have a cash injection. In other words, if they're going to have a tractor that produces a lot of, like, that can, they can use to produce a lot of food, the tractor requires fuel. I'm not trying to dumb it down. I'm trying to say that nobody is going to give the farmer fuel for his tractor in exchange for a dozen eggs or a couple of chickens or a pig. You can't use the barter system that way for a product like fuel for your tractor. You just can't. Somebody wants cash for that product. So the farmer has to have cash. That way he can go buy the things that he absolutely needs, has to have fertilizer, fuel for his tractor, parts for the tractor, things of that nature, in order to go out there and produce a lot of food to keep food prices down. Okay, so let's bring that full circle then. The FSA had a propaganda problem on their hands. If you give cash money to farmers, which we had to do, anybody else in the economy would say, well, I want cash as well. I don't have to go work for it. Just give me cash and I'll spend it the way I want it spent. Well, the government of the United States of America did not want to do that. We didn't want to do it then. We don't want to do it today. We don't want to give people enough cash so that they don't do anything else except live off of welfare. We don't want that. We don't like that as a society, and it does not work well with our capitalism. So the Farm Security Administration had to come up with uh, propaganda. They had to show that however bad it was for everybody else, it was even worse for the farmers. And then that leads us to Dorothy Alange. She was out there taking pictures of farmers for the Farm Security Administration to show everybody, everybody in America that however bad it was for them, it was worse for the farmers. And so the government has to give farmers cash. Now, if you go to Google search images, and, pri and put in there, put into the search engine, Great Depression. The picture that you see over there on the upper right is exactly the picture you will come up with. That is the icon of the 1930s, the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl. That picture was taken by Dorothy Alange, and it's called, it's entitled, Migrant Mother in the Palma, California, 1935. The very depth of the Depression. Now, many people think that that photograph was just a snap that she happened to catch just at the perfect moment. Well, it isn't. As you can see from the rest of these photographs, uh, Dorothy Alon stopped. She saw this woman on the side of the road. And the story goes that she stopped and said, listen, exactly, you know, what's, uh, I, I can see you're having problems. And the woman said, yes, we're, we're almost out of gas. We're stalled here on the side of the road. And, you know, my husband's out there looking for her work. So he gets some gas and try and go find a job someplace else. Okay, fine. So Dorothy Alange said, listen, let me take some photographs of you. Well, imagine that approaching somebody who's absolutely destitute, who's under this sort of stress, and saying, listen, let me take a few pictures of your misery. Well, nobody wants that. And so Dorothy Alange had to say to this woman, okay, you know, I'll give you 15 or $20, a few dollars, whatever it is, and take your photograph. And the woman finally said, well, okay, because her and her children were starving. So she composed one photograph after another. And the one that actually sold was Margaret Mother in Napoma, California, 1935. Again, as I've said on several of these other uh, um, images of the Great Depression, the New Deal, I don't even care about these photographs even a little bit. 
I want you guys to think about all of the infrastructure that was necessary for her to take that photograph. She had to have several cameras. Those cameras need to have somebody that's able to tune them up and repair them. I'm sure she did a lot of that herself, but that's the thing that had to happen. Take them apart, polish all the lenses, put them all back together again, make them function. Then she had to have film. Then the film had to be developed. That takes special chemicals. It takes special paper. And so if the Farm Security Administration got her out there, they had a whole bunch of other uh, photographers as well. And there's hundreds and hundreds of ph photographers traversing the land doing all this propaganda. And that meant lots of photographic paper, lots of pe people that could work on cameras, lots and lots of film. And it's not just the FSA doing that. There's all sorts of other projects out there that fulfill a need for a niche industry, and that is photography. And that's what I'm driving at. This program helped a niche industry, and that is photography, that otherwise might have been damaged or destroyed during this Great Depression. Now, Dorothy Alange went on to take a whole lot of other photographs, and uh, some of them are amazing compositions. Some of them are in this... Uh, slide and there are two of them that I really want to discuss. One of them is at the lower left where you see those children in front of that you know that tree and they're standing in the shadow. Now again this is an amazing composition. In other words it's called chiaroscuro and that's the difference between light and dark. And so the children their faces are in the shadow. Uh, some of them are barefoot as you can see. Uh, some of them have like really kind of filthy clothing on. And these are Margaret farm worker children at school after a day's labor in Yuba, Arizona, Yuma, Arizona, 1933. So what's important about this as a piece of propaganda is that they are white children and their clothes are filthy and some of them are barefoot. It's all right if the broader population see Hispanics in that condition or African Americans in that condition, but the propaganda value is that these are white children and they're in that condition. And so again, the plight of the farmer is worse than it is for anyone else. Very briefly, I want to draw your attention to the upper right. And that's sort of a farmhouse out there in the middle of nowhere, presumably in the south somewhere. Well, Dorothy Alonge said, okay, well, this photograph will sell. And she thought this was an important photograph. She took it and she got everybody out there. This is the plight of the poor in the south. Well, the FSA didn't want to have anything to do with this photograph. And you can imagine why. Because the people that were in the photograph are African Americans. They are black. And so the FSA said, well, we're not going to buy that and we're not going to buy that photograph. Which leads me to a kind of a sidebar here. And when we talk about Dorothy Alange and uh, these, pho these photographs, uh, she talked about this a lot later on and she was kind of bitter about it. And I can imagine why. When she would show up at the FSA saying, listen, here's all the photographs that I've taken and here they are all. Here they are all. And I've developed them, and they're all ready to go. And the Farm Security Agency, their officials would go, okay, well, I'll take that one, we'll take this one, we'll buy this one, this one, that one. Uh, but the rest of these, you know, we're not going to buy those. Those are just snaps, and you can have them. But we'll buy the rights and everything to these photographs, and we'll use them. And she would say, well, okay. But it come to find out when male photographers would show up, the FSA would say, yeah, we're going to buy all the photographs that you have, no matter what the composition or the propaganda value. And she became really, really angry about that because she pointed out her costs were the same. You know, she had to have fuel for her vehicle. Her vehicle would break down and she had to have the repairs for that. You know, she needed new tires. She needed film. She needed all the things that she needed, just the same as the men. But the FSA defended themselves by saying, yes, well, men are heads of households and you are a woman. And so this infuriated her because her photographs were qualitatively better than theirs. But they were being paid for all their photographs, so she was only being paid for a select a few. Uh, on the other hand, um, when we talk about the macro economy, uh, this saved the photograph industry. It really, really did. So in terms of like uh, getting a program, what I'm driving at is getting a program that will fit niches as well as big giant programs that would help the macro economy. Uh, FDR and his administration tried everything. They tried everything they could. Let me present to you one last example of the Alphabet Soup programs, and that is uh, Thomas Hart Benton, and he was a painter. Now, 
As you can see, Thomas Hart Benton was a gifted artist. Uh, he was a gifted artist uh, in the 19-teens and 1920s. But there's going to be a series of programs uh, that are associated with the New Deal that allow artists to go out and paint big, gigantic murals all across America. To be clear, our administration, the FDR administration, did not want artists down in some hole digging a foundation for a big, giant dam. If you have a gifted artist, put those guys to work. In other words, we have another niche industry. And so Thomas Hart Benton is only one of many, many, many individuals doing what we're talking about. Now, when you take a look at these images, here it's a little bit hard to convey. But these images are gigantic murals. Uh, the one you see in the upper left, that's like three stories tall. It's huge. And so think what has to go into one of these paintings. They're, they're enormous compositions. All of them are. None of these are small. They're gigantic murals. And they're very, very late Art Deco. They're a little bit uh, Art Nouveau, but they're very, very late Art Deco. And Thomas Hart Benton was the master of that. But observe what he's trying to convey with every one of these images. When you take a look at Parks, the Circus, the Klan, the Press, 1933, even a little bit out of our time, which is Boomtown, 1928, Power Plant, 1934, and then uh, Hollywood, 1937, what he's conveying in every one of these is movement. Things are going crazy. Things are happening. People are fighting. Fires are going on. Men are typing. There are people fighting and brawling in the streets. You know, the, in Power Plant, 1934, there's all this actions going on. Men are building things. Hollywood, 1937, you see a stage set in the far background. It's on fire. It's burning up. You know, there's a guy that's like got the fan going. There's some, you know, woman in the foreground. She's being, you know, put into some sort of movie or other. People are, are, are doing things. They're all about action. And again, it's all very, very uh, Art Nouveau, but especially very, very Art Deco. I don't care a little bit about these paintings, not even a little bit, but I want you guys to think about what it would take to paint one of these. You have to have this big, giant wall. Again, some of these wall spaces are gigantic. Parks, the circus, the clan, the press, it's like, like I said, it's like three stories tall. This thing is enormous. So you have to do all the preparation work, and that takes lots and lots of men. Then you have to get all the various paints. It takes lots and lots and lots and lots of paint. Then he has to do all the sketch work. Then he's got to lay it all out. Many times he's not actually doing the painting until it gets to some sort of detail work. He's telling other painters, some of his students and understudies, okay, do the background. It needs to look like that. Do that. It looks like it needs to do the other thing. And again, this requires a lot of paint brushes. And it's just, it's just another niche industry. All these gigantic colors... Uh, these intense colors, and then lots and lots and lots of it to paint any one of these pictures. But we don't want an artist like Thomas Hart Benton down in some hole, digging a hole for some foundation for some bridge or road. We want him out there, an artist of this quality. We want him out there working as an artist. And that preserves a niche industry. And that's the whole idea behind the New Deal. It's not just small or intermediate projects. It's huge projects as well but it covers many, many different niches within our economy. It gets the entire economy going, not just bits and part pieces of it. So with that in mind, let's uh, continue on with uh, the 1930s. Uh, we're going to skip this slide, just skip right through this slide. Well, you know what? Okay, I got it up there. I'm going to talk about it for just a second. On the top part of the slide, you see a big, giant um, uh, sculpture. And this is... Um, in the Capitol building in Nebraska, Kansas. And what you're looking at here is a big, gigantic stone, and then you carve away everything that doesn't look like the stuff you see on there. In other words, there's a log cabin, there's Native Americans shooting a bow, uh, there's buffaloes and bears and all sorts of other wildlife. So this takes a very specialist kind of um, sculpting to sculpt away everything that, take away everything that doesn't look like what you want in there. And please understand, ladies and gentlemen, if you make a single mistake, then you've basically got to start all over again. But I'm not even interested in this sort of artwork. I mean, it interests me uh, as, as a piece of artwork, but I don't care about that. I care about the economy. That to find this big, gigantic slab of stone, it's huge, as big as a building. Then they had to, like, get it out of the quarry, 
take it over there to the Capitol building in Lincoln, Nebraska, chop out some part of the wall in the Capitol building in Lincoln, Nebraska, slide this in, and then begin this sculpture. And so how many people got put back to work? Huge numbers of them. And so there's paintings like the one you see down the bottom. They're all over the place. They still find these things today. They're everywhere. So the New Deal, um, these, art, these art projects, that's a significant part of the New Deal. The Dust Bowl. Now this part of the, the 1930s, this, is a, a, this has nothing to do with the New Deal. We're moving on. And it turns out there was a tremendous economic downturn but then on top of that, there's an ecological catastrophe that takes place right through the 1930s. And this is broadly referred to as the Duff Bowl. Now, this actually affected my family in particular, where my family actually comes from. If you look at the map on the lower right, that dark orange part, my family comes from that part of the world. The part of my family that doesn't come from Germany, they come from there. And so... Let's take a look at what happens. Now, we've talked about the Homestead Act of 1862, and that made land really, really easy to get in the very area that we're talking about, especially that area in the map on the upper left, all that area in yellow and all that area in red. It made all that land really, really easy to get. Go out there, survey out the land, put an improvement on it within a year, and the land is yours. Okay. Well, starting around the 1910s and going until the late 1920s is what's called the Great Plow Up. The Great Plow Up. And this is when farmers, and we've talked about this, become industrialized. They get equipment that can really turn over a lot of land. And so having gotten the land, a lot of farmers are going to begin to farm it. That's what they do. But this is land that should never have been turned into farmland. Now, the area that you see out there, especially in that yellow color, that's all grassland. And I'm not trying to dumb this down. We just got to like make sure that you guys understand what's going on. All that was grassland. It had been grassland for millennia, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of years. Fine. Well, oat, wheat, and barley are a species of grass. That's what they are. Oats, wheat, and barley are grasses. And so the farmers turned up all that land and planted in there oats, wheat, and barley. In other words, where normal grass would grow, oats, wheat, and barley would grow as well. Later on, as it turns out, corn will grow there, and so will maize and other, all, the, all sorts of other uh, usable crops. So we have the great plow up, and marginal land is being put into oats, wheat, and barley and other usable crops. Then along came a drought. Now, this is just the normal weather cycle. And the native grass can do that. It has very, very deep roots. And so it can survive a drought. Well, a farmer who had planted wheat, he's lost his crop. So he goes to the local bank and he says, listen, I'm, I'm experiencing this drought. I lost my crop. Loan me some money. And the bank will say, okay, because the farmer has the land. The farmer can hawk the land. Maybe not all of it, but a significant part of it. And he'll get fuel, he'll get food, he'll get seed crops for the next year, and then he'll give it a try. Well, in this particular case, in 1931 and 1932, and then again in 1933, we had a drought three years in a row in that gigantic area there. So the next year, the farmer says, listen, we had another drought and my crop is dead. And he goes to the bank, he says, well, loan me some more money. Then the bank says, no. I want to be clear on something. The bank does not want to be a land owner. They don't. Furthermore, all the other farmers are coming to the bank and saying, loan me some money so I can like get through the year. They're saying that too. And they too are trying to hawk the land. Well, the bank does not want that. So the bank says no. So the farmers go out to their family. They go out to everybody else. They hunker down. They really just are basically starving themselves. But then they scrape together enough cash, enough uh, um, wherewithal, to put in one more crop, they work together. But then the third year, they had a drought again. 31, 32, and 33, they had droughts all three of those years. So then the only thing that the farmer can do is abandon the land. Please write that down. 
That is the map in the lower right. You can see all those red lines heading out to California and Washington. As it turns out, a significant part of my family actually did that thing. They moved to Oregon. Oregon, you know, the rains never fail there. And you just take some seeds, throw it out there. It's going to grow. Ask any pot dealer you know. They grow stuff out there. And so my farm family, they moved out into that area. So we have an internal migration that takes place. Uh, John Steinbeck wrote a book called The Grapes of Wrath, and that's what it is about. It's turned into a very famous movie as well. So many of the farmers had to abandon the land. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, which is most of you, because we don't typically live in a farm community anymore, the only part of the land that is actually productive is the top about six or eight inches. That's it. Below that, the soil has always been anaerobic. Oxygen does not get down there. Bacteria does not get down there. The part of the, of the soil that's active is called humus, and it does not act down there because it's anaerobic. It's in an anaerobic condition. Well, if you have a drought three years in a row, and the grass is all grown, gone, and the oat, wheat, and barley is gone, and everything's gone, then the wind gets up, and you have this catastrophic effect where the, we have these big, giant dust storms. So real quick on this, I'm almost done with it because then we need to move on. All of these states, Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, Wyoming, they all went to Washington, D.C., all their representative centers, and they said, listen, you've got to give us some money to help us to recover from this drought, these drought conditions. Okay, well, all the other states said, no, we're not going to give you any extra money. We just think you're panhandling a little bit. You want to get extra resources for, you know, bad weather, and we're not going to do that. We won't agree to that. There's only a limited amount of resources available, and you guys are trying to, like, get too much for it. Well, the story goes that there was a big, gigantic dust storm, and the dust picked up everything that you see in those plain states, and in Washington, D.C., over 1,000 miles away, it became so dark during the day that they had to light the street, street lights on. People had to drive around with their headlights on in Washington, D.C., on the East Coast. And the joke was, and it was a bad joke at that, that was the day that Kansas came to town. Well, that was Kansas. And so all this topsoil picked up because the winds picked up and moved it, shifted it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to point something out to you. There are large parts of Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, the Texas Panhandle, that are unproductive to this very day because the soil is gone. It's destroyed. It's simply turned it all into sand dunes, which can never, ever, ever be brought back. And so when we talk about the Dust Bowl part of this weather event, this weather catastrophe that took place in the 1930s, Please understand that's not just something that you can overlook in a history book. Thousands of people were negatively affected by this, tens of thousands. And children from that area, era that were very, very young, their lungs could not put up with this. And so they were breathing in all this dust that was this ambient dust that was in the, in the air, and it was forming a sort of a concrete in their lungs and killing them. And so this is murderous. You go to any cemetery in that area... And take a look at the dates, and you'll see lots and lots and lots of children dying because of all that dust that was in the air. And their little lungs just could not take it. They couldn't filter it out. Many, many people died over this. It was a really, really spectacularly bad event. So on top of an economic downturn, we have this ecological catastrophe on our hands. And so when we talk about the 1930s, understand this is a, an era that will negatively impact everybody's attitudes going along for the next an entire generation, the next 40, 50, 60 years, people will take a look at the 1930s and say that was a really, really dark time in American history. Let's continue on moving, uh, moving along with uh, what we have to talk about in the 1930s, though. So FDR and the Supreme Court, I have two slides that uh, contend with this. So FDR and the Supreme Court, and what I want you guys to get out of this, a strong note here, Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not have it all his own way. He did not. You would think with the New Deal and all these programs coming along and the recovery of the economy that was slow but steady and people could see how it was going to work, that FDR would have it all of his own way, but he did not. 
And the Supreme Court is uh, a, a very good example of FDR not getting his way on everything. So a lawsuit emerged that talked about the NRA. Now, I've mentioned that before in an earlier presentation. That's why I'm mentioning it again now. And the lawsuit said that the National Recovery Act uh, was unconstitutional. That this, this lawsuit was brought out by conservative interests. That's fine. That's their business. And it went through the state and federal courts and finally arrived at the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court claimed that many of these New Deal programs were unconstitutional. Now, I have this on the next slide. And so... Let's talk about the court, and then I'll go over to the next slide, and we'll like really get into uh, what's really going on here constitutionally. I want to draw your attention to this picture of the Hughes Court. There's Chief Justice Hughes down there at the bottom in the middle. And take a look at the age of these guys. They're very, very old. They're older. Okay, so we're in the middle 1930s. And so what's important here is that many of these justices were put into the Supreme Court during the 1920s, when it was Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover. And Harding and Coolidge and Hoover were conservatives. That's fine. Even Wilson had a very strong conservative uh, element to him, and so did Taft. We've talked about that. And so these men, their political flavor, if you will, is very, very uh, conservative. And so they, uh, they insist upon a strict interpretation of the Constitution. Furthermore, six of the nine justices were over the age of 70. That's perfectly all right. That's perfectly constitutional. Uh, once you're on the Supreme Court, you cannot be taken off. Uh, the individual either has to resign or uh, usually they just die. That's what happens. So with that in mind, let's go on to the next uh, slide and kind of get into uh, what's, what's going on here in, in greater detail. So FDR knew that two issues were coming up that he wanted saved. Strong note here. I pointed this out before, let me point it out now. The NRA, the, the AAA, some of these other uh, alphabet soup programs had done what they were supposed to do. And FDR was prepared to have those killed. The NRA in particular, it had done its purpose, but then it had fallen on bad times, it was no longer working right, and he wanted it killed. Well, it was just easy politically for him to allow the Supreme Court to kill it. So the Supreme Court did, and he was okay with that. But there were two issues that were coming up, Social Security and the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB. It's up there in that first bullet point, Social Security and the National Labor Relations Board. They were coming up for review. There had been a lawsuit against them, and FDR wanted those two things saved. He wanted those. So in an effort to save Social Security, which we all like, whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, Social Security will be there from now on. It's well administered. There's plenty of money into it. It'll be there when you become older. It's going to be there. And so that is going to be there, and we, we enjoy that a lot. Um, not whether you believe that you might be a, a, a recipient of Social Security, but think about your mom and dad or your grandparents. It may be that you love your mom and dad. It may be that you, your, you love your grandparents. But you don't want them living with you so as it turns out, you like Social Security, no matter how young you are. You might be in high school right now, but I'm telling you right now, you like Social Security. The National Labor Relations Board, you like that too. Uh, especially today, it gets um, initiated, it gets used when the big sports uh, programs, uh, the National Basketball Association or the National Football League or hockey, uh, when those guys go on strike. Now, I'm not interested in a little bit, even a little bit, in a bunch of overpaid sports players. But there's guys running the cameras, the guys that are on the field, the referees, the guys that are running concession stands, all the guys that are actually running all the electrics in these stadiums. Those guys need money, too. Those are thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs for guys that would like men and women who would ordinarily be at work, but because these overpaid sports players are, like, upset about something. So the NRLB comes in, and they want to solve the situation fast so we can get more people back to work, which is what FDR wanted in the first place, and it still works today. Well, the court was clearly going to throw these out as unconstitutional for reasons we'll get into in just a minute. But FDR wanted it saved. So in March 1937, he has a fireside chat. We've already talked about fireside chat. 
He's going to bring the issue to the people. And he's going to say, listen, here's what's going on. I disagree with what the courts are doing. I don't think it's right. He pointed out that these Supreme Court justices are appointed for life and cannot be forced into retirement. So, ladies and gentlemen, strong note here. He proposed a law. For every judge above the age of 70, the president may appoint another justice through the normal process. That is constitutional. Under Article 2 and Article 3, that is perfectly constitutional. He can do that. He can do that. It required, you know, it's not, uh, this is not a constitutional amendment. It's just a law that adjusts the appointment of judges. It's perfectly constitutional to do that. If it went through Congress and they signed it into law, it just backed him up. It's perfectly constitutional. But in this case, there would be six new justices, all appointed by FDR and done in a very, very short period of time. Strong note now, this is called court packing. And the idea is you put a whole lot of guys on there that are of a single political flavor. In this case, they would all be Democrats. And they would then support the New Deal. Now, the reason why he's going to do this, strong note here, very strong note here. Social Security, NRLB, the Alphabet Soup programs, these are all perfectly constitutional in and of themselves. Article 1, Section 8 allows that to happen. Congress and the president can do just about anything they want to the economy because we have a representative form of government. What these judges were saying is that there was a, a conflict of the two branches of government that FDR was telling Congress what to do and Congress is simply doing this. And this is called a separation of powers problem. The problem is constitutional and that is a separation of powers issue. Congress was not debating this issue in and of themselves. They were simply doing what the president told them to do, which is not the way it works. But this is very, very debatable. And some of the justices had said, listen, that's actually not what's going on. In other words, all these decisions throwing out parts of the uh, New Deal program, they'd been split decisions. So there were some of these conservative judges who were saying, no, this, this is not how it works. In other words, there is not a conflict of interest here. There's not a uh, separation of powers issue going on here at all. So FDR says, well, listen, I'll just pack the courts and get what I want anyway. This was only ever a threat. But the threat was real. So sure enough, these justices went back and said, you know what? It turns out Social Security and NLRLB, they are constitutional after all. After all. Wow, it turns out that there was not a uh, separation of powers issue going on at all. And there never had been. And so FDR did get his way. Strong note. And I have it there at the bottom. The crisis is adverted. The court deemed Social Security and NRLB to be constitutional. They were. And FDR's scheme of court packing was instantly forgotten. He got rid of it right away. Now, he was getting a lot of negative feedback from ordinary people. They were saying, listen, don't do this because we don't like the courts to become politicized. Well, of course, his answer was the courts were politicized already. He just wants to politicize on the Democratic side. But court packing was very, very um, unpopular among the people, and he knew it. But the minute he got his way, he dropped the scheme. So again, to bring it full circle, FDR is not having it all his own way. He's not getting everything he wants. There is pushback, especially from the conservative side. I have another example coming up on the next slide. The Kingfish, Huey Long. This is his nickname. Huey Long, a Democrat, a governor and senator from the state of Louisiana. His nickname is the Kingfish. Now, for those of you guys who are interested, and I urge you to do it, go to YouTube. There are several YouTubes of him out there, and you will see that Huey Long was an extremely dynamic speaker. He's very much a populist. Uh, in other words, what people wanted done, he did it. Now, Huey Long is coming out of Louisiana, and Louisiana was run by a political machine, and it was particularly corrupt even in an age of significant corruption going on politically. On the other hand, it's a populist, and I have it on there in that bullet point. Um, he came up with many, many populist programs, road building, free textbooks for college, something that might you know, interest all of you. 
um, night classes for adults. That interests a lot of people. You know, adult education, they had to do that at night after they got off of work. He insisted on expanding the state universities, hire more professors, make them work at night. Everybody agreed with that. Build airports all over the place. Now think about this. This is the early to mid-1930s, and Huey Long's is insisting that there are airports all over the place. And if you fly over Louisiana at kind of a medium altitude, you'll see that there's little airstrips everywhere. Well, was there a demand for airports in the 1930s? Uh, probably not. I don't care about that, neither did Huey Long. How many people did it take to build an airport? You got to put in the control tower, you got to put in the airstrip, you got to put the access roads in, the fuel tanks, you got to put in all that stuff in. All the hangars and all that, you have to put all that stuff in. So, how many people got put back to work? Road building? I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, if you ride around in Louisiana for very long, you're going to discover there's not a straight road in that whole state. There is not. As you all know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So what do you long say? Don't build anything in a straight line, you fools. Put big giant curves and loops in there. That way it puts people to work. It keeps people working because the roads are longer. I've driven to Louisiana several times. I'm telling you right now, there are bridges to nowhere throughout that whole state. There are overpasses over every highway that start in an open field and end in an open field, and there is not an access road anywhere to get to that overpass. But it put people back to work, and that's what he wanted to do. Now, the way he's going to pay for this is he's going to tax the rich, and he insisted on that. Find rich people and stick it to them, hang it to them, make the rich pay for everything. Tax the rich, tax the rich. When we get done taxing the rich, tax them some more. And he agreed with that. And everybody agreed with that as well. So he appoints cronies and all the, at every level of political office. He was very, very corrupt, and he just helped out his friends. Fine. Everybody agreed with that. It's Louisiana. Everybody was okay with it. So I put on there, elected to the Senate after appointing, after appointing a governor. Well, he had been the governor, and so he appoints a governor in behind him, basically, and he tells that governor to put him in the Senate. So he gets elected in the Senate. It's all corruption. So I have elected in, like, bow legs there. It's, in other words, he got elected, but the election was, like, basically rigged. So here's what's going on, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the important point that I want you to take. In 1934, FDR has to go for re-election. So, uh, in other words, he got elected in 33. I'm sorry, 34, he's, he's in office, 35. and 36, he's going for re-election. And so, you know, uh, there's not any pushback from the right. Back in those days, the saying was that uh, a Republican could not get elected dog catcher. They were being blamed unfairly, in my estimation, for the Great Depression. It's not fair that they got blamed for that, and I've mentioned that before. There was so many other things going on, and then this economic downturn took place. So you can't blame it just on one party, but people did at the time. The Republicans were being held responsible for that. And so, politically, the threat was not from the right. The threat to FDR politically was from the far left, and that is Huey Long. So Huey Long is working in the Senate. He's making national speeches. Everybody loves him as a speaker. He's very dynamic. Uh, he's got a personal and outgoing um, a persona. Uh, he's, got a, he's got an interesting accent that everybody really did uh, fall in love with. He's got that Louisiana accent going on. And he's talking a language that everybody does like. FDR famously said about this man, he's the most dangerous man in America. Not because of his programs, but because if his programs got put into practical application, it would undermine capitalism as an economic mechanism. In other words, it's one thing for you to stick it to the rich in the tax code. It's another thing to take everything from people who are making a little bit of money. You can't just hammer the rich and take everything from them. You can't turn major industries, the steel industry, the automobile industry, you can't simply take the banking industry and turn that into a public stake. That is to say, uh, get the Treasury to buy a whole bunch of stock in those companies in the name of the people of the United States of America. That's not the way it works. You just can't do that. It's, it's not, uh, it de-incentivizes 
capitalist, and de incentivizes big businessmen. But Huey Long was absolutely, he was making a lot of headway. He was getting a lot of votes. He was stealing a lot of votes from FDR, who otherwise would have been reelected without any trouble at all. But it turns out that uh, Huey Long had uh, made an enemy in his brother-in-law. Uh, there were two things, his brother-in-law, uh, a doctor as it turns out, but it turns out that he was a man of like a limited uh, mental cap capability. But this doctor, his brother-in-law, wanted a big job in government. And Huey Long says, listen, you're not really uh, suitable for this job. And so he wouldn't give his brother-in-law a job in government. Furthermore, Huey Long, as it turns out, had a mistress. Evidently, he could really easily get away with that sort of thing back in those days, and he had a mistress. So he was married to this doctor's sister, but he was playing around on this doctor's sister because he had a mistress. The story goes, and it's a fantastic story, so I'm going to indulge in it really quickly, that uh, he, was, uh, walking down, he was walking down some steps in the Capitol building there in Louisiana, in Baton Rouge. And uh, there, uh, along down, down the other side the end of the hallway, came his brother. Well, Huey Long was always afraid of being assassinated. He had a fear of it, a phobia. And so he was always surrounded by uh, bodyguards. And they had submachine guns and rifles and shotguns and everything. So his brother-in-law was coming up to him, and he walked right by the bodyguards who knew him and got right up to Huey Long and pulled out a pistol and shot him. Well, all the uh, bodyguards, they like pulled out all their guns and they started winging bullets left, right, and center. Ga, 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 ga. Boom, boom. Ga, 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 ga. They started shooting every which way. And in the Capitol building down in Baton Rouge, there are like, bullet holes everywhere right where the assassination took place. As it turns out, there were two of the bullets that were in Huey Long that came from his bodyguards. So they were just shooting left, right, and center. Anyway, a few minutes later, uh, Huey Long's wife came in, and she was screaming her head off and yelling, and she came up. And she said, well, now, who's that woman over there who was also screaming and yelling? And it turns out Huey Long's mistress was there as well. So there's Huey Long. He's dead, shot full of holes. His brother-in-law is shot full of holes. His wife, she's there. Her brother is dead, and her husband's dead. And there's this uh, mistress woman, and she's screaming her head off too. So it was a uh, fiery end to Huey Long, which is unfortunate. But what I want you guys to get out of this entire part of this presentation is, once again, FDR does not have it all of his own way. So let's continue on. We're almost done with the 1930s. At least that's all I have to say on this part of it. Last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about uh, our, continued, our continued foreign policy. Now, our foreign policy revolves around one major idea, and that's isolationism. So our isolationism begins kind of with Henry Cabot Lodge, that guy there in the dark photograph on the uh, right. Now, Henry Cabot Lodge had been a senior senator from Maine. He's a Republican, and he's a senior senator from Maine uh, right at the time of the Treaty of Versailles. But as you all know, during the Treaty of Versailles, Wilson acted as his own Secretary of State. And so nobody else got any political capital, nobody else got any political uh, um, spotlight from the Treaty of Versailles. When Wilson came back from Paris, you know, he'd done it all himself. Well, Henry Cabot Lodge strongly resented that. Um, and so, as you all know, a treaty has to be ratified in the Senate. So Henry Cabot Lodge, for a lot of really good reasons... Uh, he said, listen, I'm going to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, and we're not going to get involved in the League of Nations. We're not going to do that. And so he mounted a really strong campaign and made sure that uh, the Treaty of Versailles was not ratified by Congress, and we did not get involved in the League of Nations. And the main idea that he presented, and everybody agreed with, was what did America get out of World War I? Well, we got nothing out of World War I. Please write that down. The United States got nothing out of World War I. Our guys went over there. They fought really hard. They did a great job. We supplied everybody for the war. And then we got exactly nothing out of it. Well, in the late 1920s, Henry Cabot Lodge will die. His son, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., he will take over as a diplomat as well. And we'll run into him again in the 1960s. But in this particular case, it leads then to Charles Lindbergh. Now, Charles Lindbergh founded and promoted uh, the America First organization, America First. That's the name of this organization. 
uh, Charles Lindbergh, a figure of tremendous popularity. Uh, he's the first man to ever go across the Atlantic solo in an aircraft. If the aircraft that's right behind him called the Spirit of St. Louis. And so uh, Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Paris in a single engine aircraft. A single engine aircraft. It was just a, basically a flying gas tank. But I promise you, if anything had gone wrong, he'd have gone straight in the drink. So this catapulted him to the very forefront of the American attention. We really like that sort of thing. Uh, he's referred to as the Lone Eagle. Uh, he was really handsome. He was a compelling uh, speaker. And he agreed with this whole America First uh, idea. He kept saying, and he took all this off from uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, that America got nothing out of World War I. Furthermore, strong note here, America was struggling with the Great Depression. And so everybody said, we're not going to get involved in anybody else's business. We're going to take care of America first. Strong, strong note here. I want you guys to be clear in your notes on this. This resonated with the people of the United States of America overwhelmingly. And so FDR had to take up this cause. FDR, for political reasons, had to take up the cause of America first. No foreign policy, absolute, rock solid, written in stone, sealed in blood, isolationism. FDR had to agree with that publicly again and again and again. The American people wanted isolationism. Please write that down in your notes in all caps. And FDR delivered that. Charles Lindbergh, Henry Cabot Lodge, they start this idea and they keep the pressure on. And so uh, when we talk about the rise of the dictators, which is another presentation, a different presentation, please understand that I will revisit this again as a reminder of our foreign policy. Our foreign policy was absolute isolationism. All of the people in the United States of America agreed with that policy and FDR had to exhibit that policy. Thank you for your attention on this. It ran about an hour and 12 minutes. Uh, that means for the 19, 1930s, I think you've got about two hours and 15, two hours and 20 minutes of uh, material to watch. And even if you were in class on a face-to-face, -face, that's about how much time it would take. So the next presentation is uh, entitled the, the 1920s, 1930s, The Rise of the Dictators. Please take a look at that online on YouTube, and I will see you in that presentation. Thank you.